Mullah Ali tried to appease his troubled heart and to persuade him to return to his shop and resume his daily work. Your association with me, he urged, would involve me in difficulties. Return to Shiraz and rest assured, for you are accounted of the people of salvation. This is a kid actually, sorry, this is a kid that was uh, following, he had a dream, he's following Mullah Ali, that, uh, uh, that you have a big message and you're supposed to be preaching this message and, and he's, he's following him and Mullah Ali is coming back and telling him, look, if, if you follow me, you're going to get into trouble. Well, this is one of the letters of leaving, that the 18 that we were talking about. Mullah Ali tried to appease his troubled heart and to persuade him to return to his shop and resume his daily work. Your association with me, he urged, would involve me in difficulties. Return to Shiraz and rest assured, for you are accounted of the people of salvation. Far be it from the justice of God to withhold from so ardent and devoted a seeker the cup of his grace, or to deprive a soul so a thirst in the billowing ocean of his revelation. The words of Mul Ali proved of no avail. The more he insisted upon the return of Abdul Wahab, the louder grew his lamentation and weeping. Mullah Ali finally felt compelled to comply with his wish, resigning himself to the will of God. Hashi Abdul Majid, the father of Abdul Wahab, has often been heard to recount, with his eyes filled with tears, this story. How deeply, he said, I regret the deed I committed. Pray that God may grant me the remission of my sin. I was one among the favored in the court of the sons of the Farman Farma, the governor of the province of Fars. Such was my position that none dared to oppose or harm me. No one questioned my authority or ventured to interfere with my freedom. Immediately I heard that my son, Abdul Wahab, had forsaken his shop and left the city. I ran out in the direction of the Kaziran Gate to overtake him. Armed with a club with which I intended to beat him, I inquired as to the road he had taken. I was told that a man wearing a turban had just crossed the street, and that my son was seen following him. They seemed to have agreed to leave the city together, this excited my anger and indignation. How could I tolerate, I thought to myself, such unseemly behavior on the part of my son, I, who already hold so privileged a position in the court of the sons of the Farman and Farma? Nothing but the severest chastisement I felt could wipe away the effect of my son's disgraceful conduct. I continued my search until I reached them. Seized with a savage fury, I inflicted upon Mullah Ali unspeakable injuries, for the strokes that fell heavily upon him, he, with extraordinary serenity, returned this answer. Stay your hand, O Abdul Majid, for the eye of God is observing you. I take him as my witness that I am in no wise responsible for the conduct of your son. I mind not the tortures you inflict upon me, for I stand prepared for the most grievous afflictions in the path I have chosen to follow. Your injuries, compared to what is destined to befall me in future, are as a drop compared to the ocean. Verily, I say, you shall survive me, and will come to recognize my innocence. Great will then be your remorse, and deep your sorrow. Scorning his remarks and heedless of his appeal, I continued to beat him until I was exhausted. Silently and heroically, he endured this most undeserved chastisement at my hands. Finally, I ordered my son to follow me, and left Mullah Ali to himself. On my way back to Shiraz, my son related to me the dream he had dreamt. Feeling of profound regret gradually seized me. The blamelessness of Mullah Ali was vindicated in my eyes, and the memory of my cruelty to him continued long to oppress my soul. Its bitterness lingered in my heart until the time when I felt obliged to transfer my residence from Shiraz to Baghdad. From Baghdad I moved to Kazimain, where Abu Wahab established his business. A strange mystery brooded over his youthful face. He seemed to be concealing from me a secret which appeared to have transformed his life. And when, in the year A.H. 1267, A.D. 1850 to 51, Baha'u'llah journeyed to Iraq and visited Kazimain, Abdul Baha fell immediately under the spell of his charm and pledged his undying devotion to him. A few years later, when my son had suffered martyrdom in Tehran, 
Baha'u'llah had been exiled to Baghdad, he, with infinite loving kindness and mercy, awakened me from the sleep of heedlessness and himself taught me the message of the new day, washing away with the waters of divine forgiveness the stains of that cruel act. So this basically is the father of Abdul Wahab, which was a youth at the time, and he has a store. He had a store in Shiraz and followed uh, basically Mullah Ali. And of course, outside the gates, he, he was caught. He caught him with his son and forced, after beating him, forced him to his son to go back to, his, to Shiraz, to his store. And he's really discussing that uh, uh, later on he moved to, uh, from Shiraz to Baghdad. Shiraz was in Iran, Baghdad was in Iraq. And uh, he moved from Baghdad to Kazemin with, and his son Abdul Wahab established his business there. And uh, basically, he seemed to be concealing from me a secret, which that secret related to knowing of the Bab, basically. And when uh, Baha'u'llah journey to Iraq visited Kazemain, he was in Kazemain at the time. This is a city, I think, south of uh, Baghdad. And uh, apparently Abdul Wahab was uh, martyred in Tehran. Uh, and Bahala was, was uh, which is the founder of new manifestations, was uh, cons console him related to, uh, to his actions with uh, Mullah Ali as well as uh, uh, heroic acts of his son. This episode marks the first affliction which befell a disciple of the Bab after the declaration of his mission. Mullah Ali realized from this experience how steep and thorny was the path leading to his eventual attainment of the promise given him by his master. Wholly resigned to his will, and prepared to shed his life blood for his cause, he resumed his journey until he arrived at Najaf. In the presence of Sheikh Muhammad Hassan, one of the most celebrated ecclesiastics of Shia Islam, and in the face of a distinguished company of his disciples, Mullah Ali announced fearlessly the manifestation of the Bab, the gate whose advent they were eagerly awaiting. His proof, he declared, is his word. His testimony, none other than the testimony with which Islam seeks to vindicate its truth. From the pen of this unschooled Hashemite youth of Persia, there have streamed within the space of 48 hours as great a number of verses, of prayers, of homilies, and scientific treatises as would equal in volume the whole of the Quran, which it took Muhammad, the prophet of God, 23 years to reveal. That proud and fanatic leader, instead of welcoming in an age of darkness and prejudice these life-giving evidences of a new-born revelation, forthwith pronounced Mullah Ali a heretic and expelled him from the assembly. His disciples and followers, even the Sheikhis, who already testified to Mullah Ali's piety, sincerity and learning, endorsed unhesitatingly the judgment against him. The disciples of Sheikh Muhammad Hassan, joining hands with their adversaries, heaped upon him untold indignities. They eventually delivered him, his hands bound in chains, to an official of the Ottoman government, arraigning him as a wrecker of Islam, a calumniator of the Prophet, an instigator of mischief, a disgrace to the faith, and worthy of the penalty of death. He was taken to Baghdad under the escort of government officials and was cast into prison by the governor of that city. Okay, so here what we're discussing basically as far as the Mullah Ali is concerned, uh, remember the Sheikhis were in that area, Najaf and Karbala, which is the uh, uh, tomb of uh, Imam Hussein and uh, uh, Abbas, which was one of the, I think, uh, half-brothers of Hussein. 
So these are holy sites, Najaf and Karbala, of Shiites, uh, generally. And ironically, if you look at the uh, sheikhis at the time, these were really in the new movement in Shia Islam related to allegorical interpretation of the end of time and so on and so forth. But remember, they were quote-unquote learned of that time. So he, when he went to that uh, group, obviously the uh, students of Sheikh Ahmad Asayi and Sheikhis were quite had followers of their own, and they really, uh, quote unquote, following the doctrine, says we're waiting for the coming of the of the uh, this twelfth Imam. It's going to be imminent, but they weren't willing to give up what they had, because if the new manifestation would come in, it would completely disrupt their status and their uh, basically situation, both economically and ecclesiastically, at the time. So the first thing that happened, these are the people that were supposed to be uh, looking for the 12th Imam, rose against them because nobody wanted to lose their status or the, the method of living or uh, basically uh, changing. And this is really the whole process of this book is is really sacrificing and demonstrating what you need to go through, in what condition these people, these uh, uh, 18 people with Bob, 19 people went through, and they were most of them were prominent, uh, learned people in the Islamic doctrine, that they had to give up their belongings, they had to give up their families, they have to give up. Uh, basically their faith, and be subject to martyrdom, and most of them mar got martyred anyways. So the key really is this transition of the importance of this new message that had to be propagated throughout the land that allowed them to, to do what they did. So this is the key element that even those people that believed in in uh, basically Sheikhi movement, and they were looking for imminent appearance of 12th Imam, denied uh, basically Mullah Ali, and actually handed him to government to get punished because he was quite, un, uh, was, uh, whatever he was saying was blasphemous. Before I just interfered. I don't know if it's an open discussion. We can, okay. <laughs> what is remarkable for me here, it's uh, for any age, any manifestation, when comes with a new message, is detachment. Um, what I see detachment for the new believers, as you mentioned, a lot of sacrifices and to go and put themselves in danger and give up their life and everything and go for this new uh, message that they were waiting for because everyone in any background they are waiting for the promised one to come and bring prosperity and unity for mankind but also here detachment shows that although these sheikhis they were waiting for the promised one although they had this new understanding of uh, uh, another aspect of the uh, resurrection or the coming back of the um, manifestation or the promise month, they were, they were not waiting for the physical um, aspects of it, but still because there was no detachment, when they got the message, they couldn't find that truth. So detachment, I think, is one of the most important elements that here yeah, for I, everyone. As Gilbert uh, explained, the uh, majority, majority of it falls on their personal position. I mean, right now, 
Baha'i faith says that you have the education, you can investigate it for yourself. You don't have to have a preacher over your head or a, or a mullah to explain it. But just imagine all these preachers and mullahs would be out of their position and out of job, and they're going to think that, what am I going to do now? <laughs> so they have to hang on to the old message so long as they can until people are awakened themselves by themselves and choose their way. And sometimes when, I'm sorry, but sometimes I feel it even with individuals, they don't necessarily have a position, but the detachment from change or to go to something different also is um, a fear of going to something different. Is It blocks people from accepting new faith. Mm -hmm. Go ahead, yeah, it's like... Um, they're standing in darkness and they're saying, we're looking for the light, God sent us the light. And then when he sends them the light, they want to stand in the darkness. He say, you want us to come out of the darkness? That's why it's much easier to teach the children than people yes. who are set in their ways. Change is always harder as the age goes up and you're set in your ways and, and you're, you're in your comfort zone, you don't want things to change. So the Baha'i religion, in, and this is the beginning of it, is a journey actually. It is a journey and learning and adjust, adjusting and adopting the Holy Spirit to, to our personal lives. So it's not a destination. Why religion is nobody's handing out salvage uh, by becoming a Baha'i. Nothing happens. So there is nothing, there's nothing to sell, nothing to buy. <laughs> it's the journey that you have to go through and continuously apply the Holy Spirit to your daily actions, and that's what makes a Baha'i. It's interesting, we were just having this discussion with a friend of mine yesterday, that this blind following of people who follow blindly, you know, tradition, my family's been Muslim or Shia or Christian or this, so I have to be without that independent investigation of the truth by themselves. And we were talking about that and trying to find out where does that come from in humans? And it was interesting that he came to this conclusion himself that it's the mix between uh, culture, tradition, and it's the misunderstanding of culture, religion, and how you, when you mix all of these, you don't know what is what. And you blindly follow the family, you know, you're, you're blindly follow some tradition, that has been the tradition, and they don't go and investigate. And it takes so much courage and detachment, as you said, to put that to side and go and investigate the truth and find out what is the truth for this age and what is working, what is not working, and why it's not working, and to see what, what the new teachings are out there and what is it giving, you know, because he was, he was always looking at it from one perspective. And when we started having this discussion and talking about looking at different perspectives that each religion brings and see what is for this age. Does it work? Is it working? And he, it was very interesting to him that, you know, he started to see that, yes, you know, that whole idea, the prejudice that we built from childhood and that comes from that just blind following. Sure. Well, in reality, your, our brains are designed as an uh, ob, uh, subjective device. So you, you absorb based on prejudices or capacity that you have. So that's why science is there. Science is an absolute and objective. So a good example of it is if you take a, uh, two, three cups of water, one is boiling hot, the other one is freezing cold, and the middle one is actually lukewarm. You put a finger, left finger into the boiling water, right finger in the cold, you can actually detect the difference very easily. Both fingers, one is very hot, one is freezing cold, you pull the fingers out, put both of them into the middle finger, one finger that actually came from boiling water tells you this water is cool. 
and the other finger that is in the same exact temperature water, it, it tells your brain that that water is warm. So you're getting two separate messages from the same bowl with the same temperature. So this shows that our brain is really uh, uh, subjective device. So, and ba Abdul Baha mentions the sole purpose of religion is to create a bridge to reality for humans that under conditions where there is, as you mentioned, cultural uh, habit or prior belief may be deviating from reality of the time. So this is really the clear indication of what religion is. Because we can justify, and this is what's happening in the world today, we can justify causing harms. And majority of the prior religion, especially the doctrine of uh, Sufism or Shiites at the time, or even today, is the situation where the leader and the follower, and source of emulation. And this source of emulation concept allows people to follow even their own leader and their false statement that causes harm with this notion that they relinquish their uh, basically will to the will of this leader. Therefore, if they do anything, they're not responsible for their own action because they followed their own leader. And this reality doesn't exist. This problem doesn't exist in my religion because every individual is responsible for their own action. I think this goes back to what you said earlier that the basic tenets of all religions are the same. It's just each religion comes for a certain period of time that brings a new message, especially social rules that apply for that age. You know, like if you, if you think about it another way, I would look at it would be like medicine or a balm or medication that has a time period that it works for a certain time. And once it expires, it's useless for that medicine, for the, whatever the issue, the problem, the sickness was. And, right, and the sickness now, our society has certain sicknesses or problems that the solutions of the past religions, if you apply to it, it's not working. So it needs new solutions to make it, hopefully to, uh, that will work. Haji Hashim, surnamed Attar, a prominent merchant who was well versed in the scriptures of Islam recounted the following. I was present at government house on one occasion when Mullah Ali was summoned to the presence of the assembled notables and government officials of that city. He was publicly accused of being an infidel, an abrogator of the laws of Islam, and a repudiator of its rituals and accepted standards. When his alleged offences and misdeeds had been enumerated, the Mufti, the chief exponent of the law of Islam in that city, turned to him and said, O oh, enemy of God! As I was occupying a seat beside the Mufti, I whispered in his ear, You are as yet unaccounted with this unfortunate stranger. Why address him in such terms? Do you not realize that such words as he have addressed to him will excite the anger of the populace against him? It behoves you to disregard the unsupported charges these busybodies have brought against him, to question him yourself, and to judge him according to the accepted standards of justice inculcated by the faith of Islam. The Mufti was so displeased, arose from his seat and left the gathering. Mullah Ali was again thrown into prison. A few days later, I inquired about him, hoping to achieve his deliverance. I was informed that, on the night of that same day, he had been deported to Constantinople. I made further inquiries and endeavoured to find out what eventually befell him. I could not, however, ascertain the truth. A few believed that on his way to Constantinople he had fallen ill and died. Others maintained that he had suffered martyrdom. Whatever his end, Mullah Ali had by his life and death, and the immortal distinction of having been the first sufferer in the path of this new faith of God, the first to have laid down his life as an offering on the altar of sacrifice. 
Having sent forth Mullah Ali on his mission, the Bab summoned to his presence the remaining letters of the living, and to each severally he gave a special command and appointed a special task. He addressed to them these parting words, O oh, my beloved friends, you are the bearers of the name of God in this day. You have been chosen as the repositories of his mystery. It behoves each one of you to manifest the attributes of God and to exemplify by your deeds and words the signs of his righteousness, his power and glory. The very members of your body must bear witness to the loftiness of your purpose, the integrity of your life, the reality of your faith, and the exalted character of your devotion. For verily I say, this is the day spoken of by God in his book, the Koran. On that day will we set a seal upon their mouths, yet shall their hands speak unto us, and their feet shall bear witness to that which they shall have done. Onto the words of Jesus addressed to his disciples as he sent them forth to propagate the cause of God. In words such as these, he bade them arise and fulfill their mission. Ye are even as the fire which in the darkness of the night has been kindled upon the mountain top. Let your light shine before the eyes of men. Such must be the purity of your character and the degree of your renunciation that the people of the earth may through you recognize and be drawn closer to the Heavenly Father, who is the source of purity and grace. For none has seen the Father who is in heaven. You who are his spiritual children must by your deeds exemplify his virtues and witness to his glory. You are the salt of the earth, but if the salt have lost its savor, wherewith shall it be salted? Such must be the degree of your detachment that in whatever city you enter to proclaim and teach the cause of God, you should in no wise expect either meat or reward from its people. Nay, when you depart out of that city, you should shake the dust from off your feet. As you have entered it pure and undefiled, so must you depart from that city. For verily I say, the Heavenly Father is ever with you and keeps watch over you. If you be faithful to him, he will assuredly deliver into your hands all the treasures of the earth, and it will exalt you above all the rulers and kings of the world. O oh, my letters, verily I say, immensely exalted is this day above the days of the apostles of old, nay, immeasurable is the difference. You are the witnesses of the dawn of the promised day of God. You are the partakers of the mystic chalice of his revelation. Gird up the loins of endeavor and be mindful of the words of God as revealed in his book. Lo, the Lord thy God is come, and with him is the company of his angels arrayed before him. Purge your hearts of worldly desires and let angelic virtues be your adorning. Strive that by your deeds you may bear witness to the truth of these words of God and beware lest by turning back he may change you for another people who shall not be your like and who shall take from you the kingdom of God. The days when idol worship was deemed sufficient are ended. The time is come when naught but the purest motive, supported by deeds of stainless purity, can ascend to the throne of the Most High, and be acceptable unto him. The good word riseth up unto him, and the righteous deed will cause it to be exalted before him. You are the lowly of whom God has thus spoken in his book. We desire to show favor to those who were brought low in the land and to make them spiritual leaders among men and to make them our heirs. You have been called to this station. You will attain to it only if you arise to trample beneath your feet every earthly desire and endeavor to become those honored servants of his who speak not till he hath spoken and who do his bidding. You are the first letters that have been generated from the primal point. That is one of the Bab's titles. The first springs that have welled out of the source of this revelation beseech the Lord your God to grant that no earthly entanglements, no worldly affections, no ephemeral pursuits may tarnish the purity or embitter the sweetness of that grace which flows through you. I am preparing you for the advent of a mighty day. Exert your utmost endeavor that in the world to come I, 
who am now instructing you, may, before the mercy seat of God, rejoice in your deeds and glory in your achievements. The secret of the day that is to come is now concealed. It can neither be divulged nor estimated. The newly born babe of that day excels the wisest and most venerable men of this time. And the lowliest and most unlearned of that period shall surpass in understanding the most erudite and accomplished divines of this age. Scatter throughout the length and breadth of this land, and with steadfast feet and sanctified hearts prepare the way for his coming. Heed not your weaknesses and frailty. Fix your gaze upon the invincible power of the Lord your God, the Almighty. Has he not in past days caused Abraham, in spite of his seeming helplessness, to triumph over the forces of Nimrod? Has he not enabled Moses, whose staff was his only companion, to vanquish Pharaoh and his hosts? Has he not established the ascendancy of Jesus, poor and lowly as he was in the eyes of men, over the combined forces of the Jewish people? Has he not subjected the barbarous and militant tribes of Arabia to the holy and transforming discipline of Muhammad, his prophet? Arise in his name, put your trust wholly in him, and be assured of ultimate victory. There is a footnote. The Bab refers to the letters of the living in the Persian Bayan, Vahid 1, Bab 2, in the following terms. All of these formed the name of the living one, for these are the names that are the nearest to God. The others are guided by their clear and significant actions, for God began the creation of the Bayam through them, and it is to them that the creation of the Bayam will again return. They are the lights which in the past have eternally prostrated themselves and will prostrate themselves eternally in the future before the celestial throne. Persian Bayam, Volume 1, pages 24 to 25. With such words, the Bab quickened the faith of his disciples and launched them upon their mission. To each he assigned his own native province as the field of his labors. He directed them, each and all, to refrain from specific references to his own name and person. He instructed them to raise the call that the gate to the promised one has been opened, that his proof is irrefutable, and that his testimony is complete. He bade them declare that Whoever believes in him has believed in all the prophets of God, and that whoever denies him has denied all his saints and his chosen ones. With these instructions, he dismissed them from his presence and committed them to the care of God. Of these letters of the living, whom he thus addressed, there remained with him in Shiraz, Mullah Hussein, the first of these letters, and Qudus, the last. The rest, fourteen in number, set out at the hour of dawn from Shiraz, each resolved to carry out, in its entirety, the task with which he had been entrusted. To Mullah Hussein, as the hour of his departure approached, the Bab addressed these words, Grieve not that you have not been chosen to accompany me on my pilgrimage to Hijaz. I shall instead direct your steps to that city which enshrines a mystery of such transcendent holiness as neither Hijaz nor Shiraz can hope to rival. My hope is that you may, by the aid of God, be enabled to remove the veils from the eyes of the wayward and to cleanse the minds of the malevolent. Visit on your way Isfahan, Kashan, Tehran, and Khorasan. Proceed thence to Iraq, and there await the summons of your Lord, who will keep watch over you and will direct you to whatsoever is his will and desire. As to myself, I shall, accompanied by Kudus and my Ethiopian servant, proceed on my pilgrimage to Hijaz. I shall join the company of the pilgrims of Fars, who will shortly be sailing for that land. I shall visit Mecca and Medina, and there fulfill the mission with which God has entrusted me. God willing, I shall return hither by the way of Kufi, in which place I hope to meet you. If it be decreed otherwise, I shall ask you to join me in Shiraz. The host of the invisible kingdom, be assured, will sustain and reinforce your efforts. The essence of power is now dwelling in you, and the company of his chosen angels revolves around you. His almighty arms will surround you, and his unfailing spirit will ever continue to guide your steps. He that loves you loves God, and whoever opposes you has opposed God. Whoso befriends you 
him will God befriend, and whoso rejects you, him will God reject. I think it's pretty straightforward. This passage is related to dissemination of these uh, letters of living across the land. <clears throat> the key element was detachment and warning them not to stay in one place or use even his name. Uh, so they would basically go far and wide. And because they were entrusted with uh, basically the latest messages, they could easily have stayed in the places that they were and become a source of inspiration and get attached to the material uh, benefits as well as uh, ecclesiastical benefit to become a source of inspiration. But their job wasn't... So it, this is very interesting uh, uh, dilemma for them that they had to educate and pronounce these uh, new comings and the coming of the uh, basically Messiah. So his goal was to really promote coming of Baha'u'llah. So, he, so the, the whole process is not only they had to, to be detached to propagate this message, they, have to, they had to watch every word and, and every action they had to basically make sure that they don't fall into this trap of becoming uh, uh, stationed in one place and follow the uh, benefits that would come with dispersion of, of these messages that came from uh, Bob looking for the new, new Messiah. Chapter 4, Mullah Hussein's journey to Tehran. With these noble words ringing in his ears, Mullah Hussein embarked upon his perilous enterprise. Wherever he went, to whatever class of people he addressed himself, he delivered fearlessly and without reserve the message with which his beloved master had entrusted him. Arriving in Isfahan, he established himself in the Madrisi of Nim Avar. Around him gathered those who on his previous visit to that city had known him as the favoured messenger of Seyyid Qasim to the eminent Mushtahid Haji Seyyid Mohammed Bakir. He, being now dead, had been succeeded by his son, who had just returned from Najaf and was now established upon the seat of his father. Haji Muhammad Ibrahim i Kalbasi had also fallen seriously ill and was on the verge of death. The disciples of the late Haji Seyyid Muhammad Bakir, now freed from the restraining influence of their departed teacher, and alarmed at the strange doctrines which Mullah Hussein was propounding, vehemently denounced him to Haji Seyyid Asadullah, the son of the late Haji Seyyid Muhammad Bakir. Mullah Hussein, they complained, was able in the course of his last visit to win the support of your illustrious father to the cause of Sheikh Ahmad. No one among the Seed's helpless disciples dared to oppose him. He now comes as the upholder of a still more formidable opponent, and is pleading his cause with still greater vehemence and vigour. He is persistently claiming that he whose cause he now champions is the revealer of a book which is divinely inspired, and which bears a striking resemblance to the tone and language of the Koran. In the face of the people of this city he has flung these challenging words, Produce one like it, if you are men of truth. The day is fast approaching when the whole of Isfahan will have embraced his cause. Haji Seyyid Asadullah returned evasive answers to their complaints. What am I to say? He was at last forced to reply. Do you not yourselves admit that Mullah Hussein has, by his eloquence and the cogency of his argument, silenced a man no less great than my illustrious father? How can I, then, who am so inferior to him in merit and knowledge, presume to challenge what he has already approved? Let each man dispassionately examine these claims. If he be satisfied, well and good. If not, let him observe silence, and not incur the risk of discrediting the fair name of our faith. 
Finding that their efforts had failed to influence Haji Seyyid Asadullah, his disciples referred the matter to Haji Muhammad Ibrahim E. Kalbasi. Woe betide us, they loudly protested, for the enemy has risen to disrupt the holy faith of Islam. In lurid and exaggerated language, they stressed the challenging character of the ideas propounded by Mullah Hussein. Hold your peace, replied Haji Muhammad Ibrahim. Mullah Hussein is not the person to be duped by anyone, nor can he fall a victim to dangerous heresies. If your contention be true, if Mullah Hussein has indeed espoused a new faith, it is unquestionably your first obligation to inquire dispassionately into the character of his teachings and to refrain from denouncing him without previous and careful scrutiny. If my health and strength be restored, it is my intention, God willing, to investigate the matter myself and to ascertain the truth. This severe rebuke, pronounced by Haji Kalbasi, greatly disconcerted the disciples of Haji Seyyid Asadullah. In their dismay, they appealed to Manichir Khan, the Mutamidur Dawle, the governor of the city. That wise and judicious ruler refused to interfere in these matters, which he said fell exclusively within the jurisdiction of the ulamas. He warned them to abstain from mischief and to cease disturbing the peace and tranquility of the messenger. His trenchant words shatter the hopes of the mischief-makers. Mullah Hussein was thereby relieved from the machinations of his enemies and for a time pursued untrammeled the course of his labours. The first to embrace the cause of the Bab in that city was a man, a sifter of wheat, who, as soon as the call reached his ears, unreservedly accepted the message. With marvellous devotion, he served Mullah Hussein and through the, his close association with him became a zealous advocate of the new revelation. A few years later, when the soul-stirring details of the siege of the fort of Sheikh Taubasi were being recounted to him, he felt an irresistible impulse to throw in his lot with those heroic companions of the Bab who had risen for the defense of their faith. Carrying his sieve in his hand, he immediately arose and set out to reach the scene of that memorable encounter. Why leave so hurriedly? his friends asked him as they saw him running in a state of intense excitement through the bazaars of Isfahan. I have risen, he replied, to join the glorious company of the defenders of the fort of Sheikh Talbasi. With this sieve which I carry with me, I intend to sift the people in every city through which I pass. Whomsoever I find ready to espouse the cause I have embraced, I will ask to him to join me and hasten forthwith to the field of martyrdom. Such was the devotion of this youth that the Bab, in the Persian Bayan, refers to him in such terms, Isfahan, that outstanding city, is distinguished by the religious fervor of its Shia inhabitants, by the learning of its divines, and by the keen expectation, shared by high and low alike, of the imminent coming of the Sahibuz Saman. In every quarter of that city religious institutions have been established, and yet, when the messenger of God had been made manifest, they who claim to be the repositories of learning and the expounders of the mysteries of the faith of God rejected his message. Of all the inhabitants of that seat of learning, only one person, a sifter of wheat, was found to recognize the truth and was invested with a robe of divine virtue. There is a footnote. Behold the land of Sad, Isfahan, which in this world of appearances is the greatest of lands. In every one of its schools, numerous slaves are found who bear the name of savants and contestants. At the time of the election of members, even a sifter of grain may put on the garb of primacy above the others. It is here that the secret of the word of the imams regarding the manifestation shines forth. The lowliest of the creatures shall become the most exalted, and the most exalted shall become the most debased. The Persian Bayan, Volume 4, Page 113. Among the Seeds of Isfahan, a few, such as Mirza Muhammad Ali Inari, whose daughter was subsequently joined in wedlock with the Most Great Branch, in reference to Abdul Baha's marriage with Muniri Khanum, Mirza Hadi, the brother of Mirza Muhammad Ali, and Mirza Muhammad Rizai I Pa Kali, recognized the truth of the cause. Mullah Sadiq e Khurasani, formerly known as Muqaddas, and surnamed by Baha'u'llah Ismul Lahul Azdaq, who, according to the instructions of Syed Kazim, had during the last five years been residing in Isfahan, 
and had been preparing the way for the advent of the new revelation, was also among the first believers who identified themselves with the message proclaimed by the Bab. As soon as he learned of the arrival of Mullah Hussein in Isfahan, he hastened to meet him. He gives the following account of his first interview, which took place at night in the home of Mirza Muhammad Ali Inari. I asked Mullah Hussein to divulge the name of him who claimed to be the promised manifestation. He replied, to inquire about that name and to divulge it are alike forbidden. Would it then be possible, I asked, for me, even as the letters of the living, to seek independently the grace of the All-Merciful and through prayer to discover his identity? The door of his grace, he replied, is never closed before the face of him who seeks to find him. I immediately retired from his presence and requested his host to allow me the privacy of a room in his house where, alone and undisturbed, I could commune with God. In the midst of my contemplation, I suddenly remember the face of a youth whom I had often observed while in Kabila, standing in an attitude of prayer, with his face bathed in tears at the entrance of the shrine of the Imam Hussein. That same countenance now reappeared before my eyes. In my vision I seemed to behold that same face, those same features, expressive of such joys as I could never describe. He smiled as he gazed at me. I went towards him, ready to throw myself at his feet. I was bending towards the ground when, lo, that radiant figure vanished from before me. Overpowered with joy and gladness, I ran out to meet Mullah Hussein, who, with transport, received me and assured me that I had at last attained the object of my desire. He bade me, however, repress my feelings. Declare not your vision to anyone, he urged me. The time for it has not yet arrived. You have reaped the fruit of your patient waiting in Isfahan. You should now proceed to Kirman, and there acquaint Haji Mirza Karim Khan with this message. From that place you should travel to Shiraz, and endeavor to rouse the people of that city from their heedlessness. I hope to join you in Shiraz and share with you the blessings of a joyous reunion with our beloved. From Isfahan, Mullah Hussein proceeded to Kashan. The first to be enrolled in that city among the company of the faithful was a certain Haji Mirza Jani, surnamed Pa Pa, who was a merchant of note. Among the friends of Mullah Hussein was a well-known divine, Sid Abdul Baki, a resident of Kashan and a member of the Sheikhi community. Although intimately associated with Mullah Hussein during his stay in Najaf and Kabila, the Seed felt unable to sacrifice rank and leadership for the message which his friend had brought him. Arriving in Qum, Mullah Hussein found its people utterly unprepared to heed his call. The seed he sowed among them did not germinate until the time when Baha'u'llah was exiled to Baghdad. In those days, Haji Mirza Musa, a native of Qum, embraced the faith, journeyed to Baghdad, and there met Baha'u'llah. He eventually quaffed the cup of martyrdom in his path. From Qum, Mullah Hussein proceeded directly to Tehran. He lived, during his stay in the capital, in one of the rooms which belonged to the Madrisi of Mirza Sali, better known as the Madrisi of Pei i Minar. Haji Mirza Muhammad i Khurasani, the leader of the Sheikhi community in Tehran, who acted as an instructor in that institution, was approached by Mullah Hussein, but failed to respond to his invitation to accept the message. We had cherished the hope, he said to Mullah Hussein, that after the death of Sid Qasim, you would strive to promote the best interests of the Sheikhi community and would deliver it from the obscurity into which it has sunk. You seem, however, to have betrayed its cause. You have shattered our fondest e expectations. If you persist in disseminating these subversive doctrines, you will eventually extinguish the remnants of the Sheikhis in this city. Mullah Hussein assured him that he had no intention of prolonging his stay in Tehran, that his aim was in no wise to abase or suppress the teachings inculcated by Sheikh Ahmad and Sid Qasim. During his stay in Tehran, Mullah Hussein each day would leave his room early in the morning and would return to it only an hour after sunset. Upon his return, he would quietly and alone re-enter his room, close the door behind him, and remain in the privacy of his cell until the next day. Mirza Musa, Ake i Kalim, the brother of Baha'u'llah, recounted to me the following. I have heard Mullah Muhammad i Mualim, a native of Nur, in the province of Mazindaran, who was a fervent admirer of both Sheikh Ahmad and Sid Qasim, relate this story. 
I was in those days recognized as one of the favored disciples of Haji Mirza Muhammad and lived in the same school in which he taught. My room adjoined his room and we were closely associated together. On the day that he was engaged in discussion with Mullah Hussain, I overheard their conversation from beginning to end and was deeply affected by the ardor, the fluency and learning of that youthful stranger. I was surprised at the evasive answers, the arrogance and contemptuous behavior of Haji Mirza Muhammad. That day I felt strongly attracted by the charm of that youth and deeply resented the unseemly conduct of my teacher towards him. I concealed my feelings, however, and pretended to ignore his discussions with Mullah Hussein. I was seized with a passionate desire to meet the latter and ventured at the hour of midnight to visit him. He did not expect me, but I knocked at his door and found him awake, seated beside his lamp. He received me affectionately and spoke to me with extreme courtesy and tenderness. I unburdened my heart to him, and as I was addressing him, tears which I could not repress flowed from my eyes. I can now see, he said, the reason why I have chosen to dwell in this place. Your teacher has contemptuously rejected this message and despised its author. My hope is that his pupil may, unlike his master, recognize its truth. What is your name and which city is your home? My name, I replied, is Mullah Muhammad and my surname Mualim. My home is Nur, in the province of Mazindaran. Tell me, further inquired Mullah Hussein, is there today among the family of the late Mirza Bazurg Inuri, who was so renowned for his character, his charm and artistic and intellectual attainment, anyone who has proved himself capable of maintaining the high traditions of that illustrious house? Yes, I replied. Among his sons now living, one has distinguished himself by the very traits which characterized his father. By his virtuous life, his high attainments, his loving kindness and liberality, he has proved himself a noble descendant of a noble father. What is his occupation? he asked me. He cheers the disconsolate and feeds the hungry, I replied. What of his rank and position? He has none, I said, apart from befriending the poor and the stranger. What is his name? Hussein Ali. In which of the scripts of his father does he excel? His favorite script is Shikasti Nastalik. How does he spend his time? He roams the woods and delights in the beauties of the countryside. What is his age? Eight and twenty. The eagerness with which Mullah Hussein questioned me, and the sense of delight with which he welcomed every particular I gave him, greatly surprised me. Turning to me, with his face beaming with satisfaction and joy, he once more inquired, I presume you often meet him? I frequently visit his home, I replied. Will you, he said, deliver into his hands a trust from me? Most assuredly, was my reply. He then gave me a scroll wrapped in a piece of cloth and requested me to hand it to him the next day at the hour of dawn. Should he deign to answer me, he added, will you be kind enough to acquaint me with his reply? I received the scroll from him and at the break of day arose to carry out his desire. As I approached the house of Baha'u'llah, I recognized his brother, Mirza Musa, who was standing at the gate and to whom I communicated the object of my visit. He went into the house and soon reappeared bearing a message of welcome. I was ushered into his presence and presented the scroll to Mirza Musa, who laid it before Baha'u'llah. He bade us both be seated. Unfolding the scroll, he glanced at its contents and began to read aloud to us certain of its passages. I sat enraptured as I listened to the sound of his voice and the sweetness of its melody. He had read a passage of the scroll when, turning to his brother, he said, Musa, what have you to say? Verily, I say, whoso believes in the Koran and recognizes its divine origin and yet hesitates, there would be for a moment to admit that these soul-stirring words are endowed with the same regenerating power as most assuredly erred in his judgment and are straight far from the path of justice. He spoke no more. Dismissing me from his presence, he charged me to take Mullah Hussein as a gift from him, a loaf of Russian sugar and a package of tea, and to convey to him the expression of his appreciation and love. I rose and, filled with joy, hastened back to Mullah Hussein and delivered to him the gift and message of Baha'u'llah. With what joy and exultation he received them from me, 
Words fail me to describe the intensity of his emotion. He started to his feet, received with bowed head the gift from my hand, and fervently kissed it. He then took me in his arms, kissed my eyes, and said, My dearly beloved friend, I pray that even as you have rejoiced my heart, God may grant you eternal felicity and fill your heart with imperishable gladness. I was amazed at the behavior of Mullah Hussain. What could be, I thought to myself, the nature of the bond that unites these two souls? What could have kindled so fervid a fellowship in their hearts? Why should Mullah Hussain, in whose sight the pomp and circumstance of royalty were the merest trifle, have evinced such gladness of the sight of so inconsiderable a gift from the hands of Baha'u'llah? I was puzzled by this thought and could not unravel its mystery. A few days later, Mullah Hussain left for Khurasan. As he bade me farewell, he said, Breathe not to anyone what you have heard and witnessed. Let this be a secret hidden within your heart. Divulge not his name, for they who envy his position will arise to harm him. In your moments of meditation, pray that the Almighty may protect him, that through him he may exalt the downtrodden, enrich the poor, and redeem the fallen. The secret of things is concealed from our eyes, Ours is the duty to raise the call of the new day and to proclaim this divine message unto all people. Many a soul will in this city shed his blood in this path. That blood will water the tree of God, will cause it to flourish and to overshadow all mankind. Great. So, basically, from previous chapter, we basically can recognize what Bob told Mullah Hussain regarding Tehran, that when you reach there, you would find actually signs of the new manifestation. And this is really a story that really uh, fulfills, fulfills that promise by Bob to Mullah Hussain. That's why he was looking at the time that he got uh, and of course, to Tehran, and through uh, brother of Baha'u'llah, he got the message to him, and of course, the reply that came from Baha'u'llah. And then he recognized that that person may be, or is, the, uh, the new manifestation that Bob was proclaiming.